What is art? That's the kind of philosophical question I'd be asking if I was talking about something that deserved it, but this isn't a review of Trigun, it's a video looking at High Guardian Spice, so I'll cut the formalities. Chances are, if you happen to come across this video and click on it, you've already heard of High Guardian from a myriad of sources, though in most cases those videos had more to do with a controversy surrounding the show rather than the show itself. I won't go into it for this video, but to sum up the whole thing, Crunchyroll, the company financing the series, released the first trailer for this thing back in 2018. The only problem was that it wasn't really a trailer, it was an abomination. Sure, there was concept art and storyboards off in the distance, but we never heard any voice acting, character names, or even a basic premise. You know, the things you show off in a reveal trailer. Really, all we got was a short that said the series would be 2D, a little weird, and it would have an all-female writing staff, so as you might imagine, people thought it was stupid. Oh, and the trailer also showed off Kate Leth as a staff writer, who is a well-known misandrist, so yeah, that didn't help matters either. Marvel and High Guardian Spice writer Kate Left refuses to apologize for Kilomen's social media posts, blames critics for not understanding she was Tumblr pilled. <laughs> what the hell is this? After that initial backlash, though, we didn't really hear about the series at all for another two years, and I was kind of certain it was thrown to the trash heap with a bunch of other forgotten lost media, but lo and behold, a new trailer dropped, people got into a frenzy again, and here we are now, seeing if the hatred this show got up to its release was justified. I could just go ahead and tell you my opinion right now, but the video's title probably has a good summary already, and and I haven't even gotten to the premise yet, so let's talk about that first. High Guardian Spice is a story of four girls of different skill sets going to a school where they learn to be guardians. I have finished explaining the concept because that's all I can describe it with. If you couldn't tell already from my attitude, this is definitely gonna be a fun video, so I hope you're ready for that. And by how brief my description of the basic plot was, you can probably already guess the first thing I want to get into is the writing and world building, so let's not waste any time. Starting off good and strong at the beginning of the series, I hate the first episode. Every moment of the first half is filled with the two characters were shown, Rose and Sage, making a big deal of the fact they're leaving to go off to a school for guardians, constantly mentioning how small their old village was, that they didn't even know the scope of the world, how they'll miss their families, that old spiel. But like, we know nothing about what life was like for them before leaving their town because we never got to see their town at all. For all I know, they could have spent their entire time before going off to school in a goddamn wooden box waiting to open it till they became old enough to leave. I've always hated it when stories try to open on a emotional moments and have us act like we've already known these characters and like them despite having just met them like five minutes ago. Some people got mad at me during my Demon Slayer video for saying the family not being explored before dying made the emotional moment less impactful since manga writers have to catch viewers in a short amount of chapters or some bullshit, but... What's this series' excuse? High Guardian is completely original, and the crew was given 12 episodes to explore their concept however they liked. What, you couldn't show even one, or fuck it, half an episode of Rose and Sage growing up in their small town before leaving so we know even the smallest bit about them and why they're emotional about going? If we started Attack on Titan, with Eren in the army, and didn't get context about why he's there for multiple episodes, don't you think him getting emotional over hearing about a titan wouldn't have the same impact on us as the audience? Not to say that High Guardian ever thinks about showing flashbacks of Rose and Sage's kids growing up in a small town, because that never happens. And what pisses me off way more about never exploring their childhoods before seeing them go off to school is that traits of characters we only got to see for a second in the first episode have to be explained to us later on rather than explicitly shown. You see, Sage is a mage, and she wants to do magic, but the school is pushing her to do new magic, while her mom is really strict about using old magic. The magic system isn't important to this point, I'll get to it later, but since Sage has gone so far away from home, and we, as the audience, have up to this point only heard, like, two lines of dialogue from Sage's mom before being separated from her indefinitely, the only way to know what Sage's mom is like is through really bad expository dialogue from Sage. Or, you know, through flashbacks, but we've kind of already ruled that out as an option. Since she can't interact with her mom to show their dynamic the two apparently have, she can only do it through telling others or talking to herself. Meaning we get many rants from the character about what she wants versus what her mom wants or whatever because there's no way to show what the mom would be saying, a situation the writers pretty much created for themselves. So the only way to course correct is to tell the viewer in a way that's completely unnatural. And that leads me into discussing this show's affinity for using exposition talking. Oh my 
my god, this series has no idea how real people interact in a regular conversation. Every episode has to have one character or another ranting about a certain issue or what the problem they're facing is when the writers are too brain dead to convey it themselves in the plot. Sometimes, the series will go as far as to force a situation where the characters don't have to talk about their stupid backstories or reasons for being sad, but they do so anyways as if that's more important than whatever problem they're currently facing. To put it simply, the writers, for the most part, don't know how writing works and would rather explain their message instead of showing it. And I think part of the reason for that comes down to how much they try to do in each episode. Chronologically, up till near the end of the season, High Guardian is pretty episodic, and for whatever reason, since the second episode had the girls split up to start doing their own things in school, the writers found it imperative to make sure all four girls always have something to do in every episode. Your main focus is about one girl feeling like her family is limiting her decisions as her friend goes through similar problems? Well, how about we also sneak in a segment about the other main character finding a new weapon for one of them and her feeling reluctant about getting it because of the way she was raised? Oops, now that both of those plot lines are in a single episode, you can't have any build-up for the one girl getting angry that her decisions are being limited and show it naturally in the plot. Guess you'll need her to blow up at her parents after their first goddamn conversation without looking for any appeal beforehand, making it feel like she's a complete asshole that won't even try talking about her concerns before yelling at them for not listening to her. And oh no, the other segment also doesn't have a lot of time to show why the girl might be concerned about breaking tradition through a flashback or clever implementation. Don't worry, just have her shout out her problems so the episode's moral is easier to understand and no more thought has to be put into the process of developing a character. I shit you not, I could go through and deconstruct almost every episode like this. The staff will try to do two stories at one time with completely different morals, leading to them either having no time to develop one story or the other, shouting themes to compensate, or one story will have some focus on it and the other will be completely meaningless and feel like filler. There's pretty much no in-between, and with how much they cram in, the audience is left with no room for interpretation, somberness, or complexity of any kind. The same idea goes for moments that could be subtle or nuanced by not having dialogue, but the writers don't trust you to understand, so they force in some unnecessary talking just in case you couldn't get a super basic concept. When the character of Tyne felt like she failed her family, went home, and then decided to look at a photo of her dad she stated to have not seen in a long time while giving a sad expression, did we really need the dialogue? I want to talk to dad. Whoa. Whoa! Really? No way, High Guardian Spice. You're such a smart show with complex themes for the youth of today. Oh, High Guardian Spice. Okay, actually, can I rant a little about something that's been bugging me since I started this show? The name makes no sense whatsoever. If you, as a viewer, were confused as to what it meant, the end of the season makes it a point to say that High Guardian Spice is meant to refer to the four main girls of the series, Rosemary, Sage, Parsley, and Thyme. We had some sick moves yesterday, High Guardian Spice. Ah, ah, he said it! He said it! Y you get it? Because they're guardians and named after spices? But hold on just a second. Rosemary, sage, parsley, and thyme are all herbs. They're not spices at all. There is indeed a difference. And hold on a second. All these characters are named after herbs. Amaryllis, Snapdragon, Parnell. The only one that I can remember that isn't is Lavender, and that's really more of a flower than a spice, so... The spice part of High Guardian Spice makes no sense. We've pretty much established that after a single Google search. From what I've heard, the four main leads are also named after a Simon and Garfunkel song. I have no idea why, but that doesn't excuse the creator from naming his show High Guardian Spice, making it clear the name is supposed to refer to the main characters, and then having none of those main characters named after spices. And actually, follow-up question, what the hell is a guardian? Does... Does no one have an answer for that? Cause I know I don't. In the second episode, it's described that Guardians forge their own ideas of what they want to stand for at a young age, but we never get told what they actually specifically do as Guardians. We know there are multiple paths a Guardian can take, including majoring in physical weapons, magic, forging, or archery, one of which is most certainly not a fighting skill. So in general, do Guardians have different paths they want to take in the world? We barely see the characters train for anything other than fighting besides Parsley in episode 3, which was barely given any focus. 
and on an obstacle maze in episode 6, which is still related to physical strength. Other than that, we have a few small teaching moments scattered here and there, but pretty much no focus gets placed on it, and the ideas displayed never come back in future episodes, or even by the end of the episode it's introduced in. So what's even the point of me mentioning it besides not getting angry comments saying I didn't mention it? Do guardians only live to go on adventures and fight? What are they gonna do then, exactly? All the teachers are said to be guardians of different varieties, but we never see them being guardians, whatever that means. What's Rose's main goal in becoming a guardian? Hell, what are any of the girls' main goals in becoming guardians? What do they want to accomplish by getting the status of guardian? Why do guardians have moments where they train in different kinds of combat when it was previously established that the four main characters were split up by the fields they wanted to partake in? The answer to all these questions is simple. I don't know. And the show doesn't seem to either. We are all small dots moving around in this universal blackness we call space. There's no time to wonder about such trivial things such as the main premise of this fucking show. Anyway, Guardian and High Guardian Spice doesn't make any sense either, so now all we're left with is High. And yeah, I'd say that's a pretty accurate summation of what I probably should have been when I decided to watch this. The fact that the show can't even give enough effort to explain its title is pretty indicative of how bad every bit of world building is, and I'm only now getting the old magic and new magic, so keep that that seatbelt fastened! So you may be asking me, JS, what's the difference between old and new magic? Well, I know that the writers are trying to use it as a metaphor for traditionalism versus modernism. That whole trope of a country bumpkin character being skeptical of modern technology and customs, that kind of thing. But really, the show never does a good job defining the difference between the two. I think, and that is a big thing. Old magic is like fairy tale stuff and general witchcraft that you'd think of when imagining a storybook witch, but also at the same time, there can also be modern magical items in the likeness of old magical items, I guess, so does that also technically count as old magic or... I don't know at all. New magic is a bit more defined, but at the same time it really isn't. So in episode 3, Sage, of course in exposition speak to no one, describes new magic in comparison to old magic as allowing you to do whatever you want at no cost, whereas with old magic you need to give something up. In the context of what she's saying, it's implied to mean energy assumedly, but later on she says that when her mom would do a plant spell, she'd plant a tree afterwards to give back, so is old magic dependent on taking the energy from everything else? She mentions how one Wands are a thing for old magic, but in new magic they have this thing called a Terra Sphere to do spells with, but we never get any explanation as to how those two are functionally different. Do traditional wands also take energy from places? Where do Terra Spheres, which are one of the only really defined new magic items in this world, get their energy from if that's necessary for spells to be cast traditionally? How does new magic get created in the first place? How does magic work in any capacity for this show? It feels like they were trying to go for some sort of full metal alchemist route with old magic where equivalent exchange is key or something, but for new magic, there's no real definition at all beyond being able to do whatever you want. My point in bringing all that up is to say the ideas of new and old magic are really poorly defined throughout the series and make no sense when put up to scrutiny, so while as a metaphor on paper it could sound like a decent idea, when put into practice there's far too many holes for it to make any sense whatsoever. And that kind of sucks because the overarching story later down the line has to do with the equilibrium of magic in the world being thrown off by the bad guys somehow, but we have no idea how the world and its magic system work beyond contradicting ideas of how old and new magic function, so all I feel at the seemingly major plot point that they focus on so surprisingly scarcely is contempt at the writers for not explaining their world better. Even when they're constantly having characters spew dialogue that no reasonable person would say out of the blue random. Oh, and in case the system wasn't already confusing enough, new and old magic can also be combined, though we only get told about it during the last episode of the show, and considering how long it took this season to come out and the negative backlash it's receiving, a season 2 is unlikely, so that idea will most likely forever remain in the air without a proper explanation. Not to mention the aspect of old versus new magic is supposed to be an integral bit of Sage's character for a good period of time, so the fact that it's so undefined means that Sage, among the generic main protags, is probably the most confusing to get a handle of. Almost as confusing as High Guardian Spice's mature audience warning that plays before almost every episode. No, your ears and eyes are not deceiving you. Before almost every episode of High Guardian Guardian Spice, there is a warning saying that the show is meant only for mature audiences, and having watched the show in full, I can wholeheartedly say that label is completely arbitrary. The best way how I can describe how this show is mature is like when a goody two-shoes character decides they want to be evil, and to do that they start acting over the top and do really minor shit, but they treat it like they've committed the worst atrocities man has ever seen. You know exactly what I mean. They think they're doing a great job mimicking something they've seen other people do before, but in reality they're 
completely out of their element and have no idea how to do the act properly. So they fall back on the little they can do and end up failing in a comedic way. That's High Guardian Spice trying to be mature. Everything about it from the writing style to the way they deliver messages to the types of messages they deliver to the art style to the way characters speak and act screams kid show all over it. But then randomly one character will say shit or bastard in the most unorganic way they possibly could. And you're just left shaking your head wondering why it was necessary at all. The answer is that there is no real good reason for it, just like the blood. And before you ask if it's some kind of Madoka Magica thing where everything starts out seemingly generic and cutesy, but then it all goes to shit real quick, no, that's not the case. The first real instance of blood in the series is in the third episode, and they just keep showing it afterwards, but most of the time the things that are bleeding aren't human at all, so the fact that they have red blood is kind of concerning and weird to me. Shouldn't these guys be bleeding bug juice or guts or something of that nature? Did this demon really need to bleed red when his arm got cut off and not some black paste that would feel more fitting with an unholy creature? Each usage of blood feels forced and tacky and completely removable to the point that having it in at all just shows that the staff wanted to act like the show was edgy or for older audiences without putting in the work to make it feel like part of the show's identity. No one would question that Konosuba is written more for teens because the writers make that distinction really clear from the first scene of the first episode. Here, it feels more like an accident rather than an intentional choice, so the fact that it's there at all just makes me think the show is that try-hard, goody-two-shoes acting like he's evil when all he did was swap the salt shaker with the pepper, leading to someone seasoning their eggs differently. There's no way anyone will take you seriously and the fact you're still trying makes you a big joke, so kindly shut up. No one cares. Oh, and would you look at that, now I've got a perfect segue into talking about the characters. I guess the best place to start would be by going back to the main two we started with, Rose and Sage, and how integral their relationship is to the series. I could end this bit right now by just saying it isn't, but that wouldn't be nearly as fun, so here we go. From the first episode, it's implied we're supposed to heavily care about these two and their friendship. Like, they are the bestest of the best friends who love each other and cuddle and hold hands, blah blah blah. But what I hate about it is that the show never puts in the work to actually make us want to care. I touched on how having an episode or so showing the past these two had before going off to school could help a lot in terms of needing less exposition and all that, but even more so, I'd say giving these two characters more defining relationship moments as kids would have helped so much to actually characterize why they're such good friends. Think back to any great relationship between two friends in whatever piece of media. For any one of them, you could list off a bunch of traits surrounding their dynamic and moments that stuck out to show why they were such good friends in the first place, yeah? Hi, guard Guardian doesn't do that. Instead, it starts off at a point where the characters are already really close, but as an audience, we don't know why that is. So what would be the best way to show it? Organic implementation during the series to show the strengths of the characters' bonds while also keeping a cohesive narrative? Or more exposition dumping to tell you what the relationship should be like because we almost never actually get to see the two interact for a full episode after the first one until the seventh. Probably doesn't take a mathematician to understand those odds. It's a really baffling move to make, but after the first episode that focuses almost solely on Rose and Sage going on adventures, there's a point made to say that they'll be completely split up for large portions of the day during school since they're in different classes, meaning we, the audience, don't get to see their relationship displayed nearly as much for long periods of time. When competent writers make this decision, it's almost always to show how a new setting is both emotionally and physically separating two characters we've gotten attached to along with their dynamic. But since this is the second episode of High Guardian and Rose and Sage's relationship falls completely flat, there's no emotional tension or intrigue about how the status quo will be broken because we've barely set the status quo to begin with. And from that point, the two really are split up for a long period of time, and though it's made out to be a big deal in the second episode, that tension is pretty much gone after. Looking at the actual chronology for the show, during the third episode they have a bit of a small subplot together, but it's barely focused on and is really more about Sage alone, so I don't really count it. No, Sage and Rose don't actually get reconnected for a full episode until the seventh, and the episode right after that they have a fight over a tiny disagreement acting like these are feelings they've built up over a long period of time, but, um... How can we relate to that feeling when there's barely been a chance to show how the two's relationship works and the various flaws it had that could lead to a confrontation like this? Since when was there an indication that Sage was always forced to do what Rosemary wanted instead of doing her own thing because she was too quiet before? We never saw that. How should we know why Rosemary is so annoying? <laughs>
Let me rephrase that. How should we know why Rosemary is so annoying to Sage when we've barely seen them interact normally? I suppose it doesn't matter, because this one small event got Sage to start acting like a total prick to Rose for no reason. And while it was implied they weren't really mad at each other by the end of the ninth episode, despite not talking at all about their issues, in the tenth, Sage goes back to being mad. So if you were binging it like me, you got kind of confused by her constant mood shifting. And I mean, the show really wants you to think that moment between Rose and Sage where they get angry at each other is some big moment by using the most superficial methods possible. The moment lingers for a while like some shocking mouth-dropping bars just got dropped, then at the end of the ninth episode, Sage says the two need space, and Rose is sad now. So she walks slowly while everyone is doing stuff, then she cries alone on a balcony at night while a super-duper sad song plays. Guys, do you not feel the emotions? It's so incredibly sorrowful. You must be crying, yeah? Cause this is just so emotional! One of my favorite characters having a minor disagreement! But wait, I forgot. Almost none of the main characters of this series get any development whatsoever that actually changes them or has some kind of impact on how they act personality-wise. Think about it. How does Rose change over the course of the season? She had this fight with Sage in the 8th episode over wanting things done her way, but does she ever reflect on that trait we were only just introduced to and make an active effort to do the opposite? Really, I can't say, since the trait was only brought up in that moment and barely is ever shown again, so if it was intended to be a trait, she sort of achieved not being that way anymore by the end of the season, but she wasn't really that way to begin with, so it didn't really matter at all from any point in time, now did it? In episode 9, Sage also mentioned how Rose would run off recklessly into battle without thinking, and while the show appears to be portraying this as a bad thing, the fact that Rose still came out on top and, once again, the issue was never brought back up again, makes me feel like it was something that was never a problem to begin with. So the fact it was brought up at all makes me wonder why the show would give me any hope of thinking Rose could get character development. How about Sage? Well, she gets a bit more assertive by the end of the season, and she cuts her hair to show how she's changed as a character and such, but really that's all. She has a moment in episode 11 where she messes up a mission and they have to kill a sea monster they hurt, and maybe you'd think that anxiety over losing would cross over into the finale in some way, but like Rose being reckless, it's never addressed again and feels like something that the writers didn't even care enough about to branch outward from. For time, I suppose she became a bit more open, but that's debatable. Really, her entire personality is centered around wanting to see her dad and save the forest she was living in, but her plan makes no sense, so she makes no sense and looks like an idiot. Basically, for a little side rant here, there's this rot creeping into her woods, and Time's mom got her out of there, but she wants to help her father, so she gets some healing water during a mission and wants her dad to, quote, copy the formula for this magical item somehow, which he can then use to save the forest? Um, what makes this whole plan sound stupid, well, more stupid than it already is, is that the healing water wasn't really closed off to the characters after they got it, which could have served as a reason for why Time couldn't get more, but it's not, so her acting like the small bit of water she has is all there is makes no sense. She also had already lost the water by the time she tried to contact her dad, so how would she know the exact chemical compound of the magical healing water? And why didn't she ask the school at all about the rot in any way? Why does only Time know about this? Fuck you, that's why. Time is a really generic character and her plans are stupid. And then there's Parsley. She doesn't grow in any way throughout the season and it feels like the writers tried the least with her. In episode 3, she had a plot about feeling trapped at home and having a younger sister just born, but you guessed it, that's resolved in a hackneyed way by the end of the episode and doesn't end up changing her at all. And I do want to clarify that shows don't always need to have outward character development for them to be good. Luffy from One Piece is a pretty static character throughout like 100 volumes at this point, but that's kind of his charm. He's dumb and stubborn and has a hard time letting things go, which can help other characters develop in different ways. No, the reason I bring all this up in High Guardian is that the crew is clearly trying to develop their characters and make them different from what they started out as. But like most bits in this series, the crew simply doesn't try hard enough to go all the way and implement permanent changes that could affect character dynamics, as shallow as they already are. The only character I can say who actually changes by the end of the season is Snapdragon, as he started out as a bully but became nice. However, his change from bully to nice guy was pretty much instant, and when you really think about it and how quickly he changed, you kinda have to wonder why he was even mean in the first place other than for forced conflict. His best friend Amaryllis also kinda changed by the end, but legit she started out as a bitch and ends up still being a bitch by the finale, but people just 
accept it now. Seriously, there's a moment where Snap asks Amaryllis if she'll stop being such an asshole, and she basically says, no, that's just me. And the audience is supposed to accept that. She's like the pure embodiment of, if you can't handle me at my worst, you don't deserve me at my best. And considering the writers didn't seem to be going in that direction, but rather the playful jerk archetype, that's a bit of an oof. As far as supposed to be relevant characters in the series go, Rose also has a mom that the show wants us to care about just as much as her, and I don't care about Rose at all, so they did a pretty good job. For real though, Rose remembering her missing in action mom and wanting to learn more about who she is is something that's focused on in many scenes, but firstly, on a chronological level, in the two, count them, two flashbacks we've seen with Rose being alongside her mother, she's like eight or nine. So I'd assume she got to know even a little bit about her mom before she left. Definitely doesn't make sense why she'd ask what her mom smelled like, as if she was some newborn when her mom decided to peace out. Plus, it's established that her mom is some sort of well-known hero, so Rose not knowing even basic knowledge about her sounds pretty stupid. Secondly, despite all this information that's out there and the memories Rose has with her mom, the character of Lavender is never really expanded on at all. Rose constantly talks about how she misses her mom and that she was a great warrior, but that's all we ever hear. Other than in one basic two-minute flashback, we never see Lavender's human side, and therefore we have no attachment to her character despite the writers insisting we should. It's not like they don't have opportunities to expand on her character either. Rose is constantly shown to feel sore about the fact her mom left, meaning she had major significance in Rose's life. So just spitball in here, why not show why that's the case? How about we get some insight into what made Lavender so special to Rose to constantly sing her praises and miss her on the daily? This show exposition dumps all the time anyway, so might as well have an actual backstory in there through flashbacks so show don't tell is used in one regard or another. They don't do that though, and Lavender remains a completely undefined character up to the end of the season, so spoiler if you care like literally at all, but I don't understand why you would. When it's revealed Lavender is working for the equal undefined bad guys now, there's not really any shock factor because we don't know much about Lavender as a character or what her goals were before the twist. So whether it's a break from her previous beliefs is a mystery to us when all we knew from Rose was that she was cool and good. Alright, so I didn't know how to segue into this next video segment, but I guess being in ordinance with characters and shit is probably the best place to do it, so here we go. Let's talk some about the touchy subject of trans representation in the show. And before any of you come to any conclusions about how this segment is gonna go, I wanna make something absolutely clear. I don't fuck with any SJW channels and think they're just as annoying as most people do. I'm also in for good trans representation in different media, as they deserve icons just as much as anyone else. My emphasis in the last statement was good representation though. And as you might be able to surmise from how I've gone on about discussing the writing talent of the crew behind this show, they didn't exactly hit the mark. Getting more specific on the character represented, this is Professor What's-His-Face. He's a minor character in the series that shows up in maybe four episodes and only has some greater focus in episodes 3 and 11. 3 being the episode where he mentions being trans. For the scene in question, Rose is trying to learn more about her mom and finds out Professor Wudz's face was friends with her. So he goes to show her some pictures, revealing that he was a female at birth. In a normal situation with the context given, if Rose was curious, she'd probably ask something along the lines of, oh, wait, is that you? You look pretty girly in this picture. And he might reply something like, oh, well, I was female at birth, but I didn't feel comfortable in it, so I used magic to become the way I am now. Anyway, back to your mom. And then the scene would have continued as normal because what's his face? Callaway, that was his name. Being trans isn't the focus of the scene. That's obviously not what happened though. When Rose notices the picture, she asks if that's his sister, and he says he's trans. Then, no joke, for the next 30 seconds, he goes off and talks about the idea of being trans and how that's affected him as a person, and when he's done mentioning that, Rose moves on with the scene as if the last 30 seconds didn't happen. The episode has nothing to do with being trans or having your life altered forever by a decision you think is for the best, none of that. All things considered, the episode is actually pretty jumbled. Other than Rose trying trying to find out about her mother while getting her broken sword fixed, we also have Parsley going on a small adventure with crabs to learn small tools are useful, and Sage running into Amaryllis and making a cat monster. This overtly long and poorly conveyed trans explanation has nothing to do with the themes of the episode, and it doesn't go back to some facet of Callaway's personality that's displayed in the story he tells about Rose's mom or anything that might connect it to the current situation. So yeah, from a writing perspective in every sense, there's no reason the explanation needed to be presented as it was in the episode with such great focus. I 
should add that the dialogue in this scene is incredibly corny, forced, and treats the audience like they're two years old discovering what a trans person is for the first time. What's the deal, Crunchyroll? I thought this show was for mature audiences, considering you plastered it at the start of every episode. It also really doesn't help the show's case that Callaway has pretty much displayed no personality whatsoever up to this point, and after it, he still shows little to no nuance beyond being trans and knowing the main character's mom. So the whole scene and the character it's attached to feel completely forced belittling, and worst of all, a bad representation for trans characters, as by giving him no other personality traits, Calloway is defined only by his transhood and little else. And you know, there is a cartoon that actually does the same kind of reveal in a much more mature, subtle way that respects the audience and gives good rep for trans characters. What I'm talking about has to do with a scene in the Netflix movie Rocco's Modern Life Static Cling, a film explicitly stated to be for kids, mind you, in which a character formerly known as Ralph reveals they're now a trans woman named Rachel. In the original series, the character was an outcast animator made to represent the creator, Joe Murray, so they had an established personality before this reveal. And when the character is shown to be trans, the writers know they don't need to say much. All that happens is that the character says they've changed, she walks out, and says, I'm not Ralph anymore, I'm Rachel. Then the main characters say that's cool, and they get going immediately. Rachel being trans also has a lot to do with the film, which deals heavily in things changing in ways you can't stop, and it's better to accept that change than shoo it away. Rachel being trans has major relevance to the story, specifically in how, when she goes back to her father, who was shown in the original series to discourage her creative ventures and not accept her for what she wanted to be, continues to do the exact same thing when she comes out to him. The writers not only made the reveal so perfect and self-explanatory in the first place, but they actually used that change to build on the relationships they'd written for the characters in the show. This move does everything that High Guardian is unable to by having Rachel reveal who she's become in a natural way that actually feels genuine, has a character trait brought back up as it's integral to the themes of the story being told, and it builds on characters that were already established instead of making their transness one of their only character traits and doing nothing else with them. Oh, and frogs also have the ability to change gender, which they don't even bring up in the movie, so that's just another level to how good the writing of Rocco's Modern Life is. Kinda almost feels unfair to compare such a mature, creative kids movie with a quote-unquote adult show that literally stated Callaway needs to take a potion every month to keep his gender transformation spell active. They gave him HRTs. They gave him magical HRTs. Again, it all feels like this is written for nine-year-olds who otherwise wouldn't get the deeper details of being trans, but this show is TV-14, so all I can chalk it up to is unoriginality. Like, in a world where fucking dragons exist and people can fly around on a broomstick while fighting with magic, they can't have something as basic as a potion that permanently changes something about them? How uncreative can you be? And while I'm talking about lack of creative flair or originality, how about we discuss the animation they've talked so much about in the trailer? I mean, they said they would do things people have forgotten to do with <gasps> 2D animation! <laughs> what a concept! Though they did also say they were gonna make stories no one has seen before, and that was now now lie, so I might want to come in with some skepticism here. From the looks of it, the show did what the trailer promised, being in 2D- HOLD ON! THOSE BOOKS ARE CG! And as you might be able to tell from the clips I've shown up to this point, the animation is not exactly what most would call, well, good. But I also can't just call it bad, either. Oh, d don't get me wrong, that's not because of some inner beauty, hidden quality type deal or whatever. The show's visuals look horrendous, but to simply call it bad or stilted wouldn't really do justice for everything negative I have to say. So let's go into depth with this. If we're talking about animation simply from a storyboarding and movement quality level, High Guardian is really inept at both. From the start, you can tell that this series doesn't have a large budget to work with, as most of the character movements are restrained, robotic, or look completely uncomfortable, only improving in a few fight scenes at the very end of the season. Weirdly, if you just took a screenshot of the series and used that to show what it looked like, some people might be fooled into thinking it wasn't that bad. But when that screenshot is put into movement, nothing feels organic or natural. Look no further than the walk cycle of any given character while they're moving across the screen. God forbid, multiple characters moving across the screen. Something about every attempt they make looks so unnatural in a way I can't put my finger on, but what I can say is that the character animation as a whole looks and feels fake. With the lip syncing in particular, I've noticed the animators did an absolutely awful job trying to match the voice to the character's lips. And if not matching up wasn't enough, there were some times where I could see the character's mouth wasn't even moving, yet they continued talking in spite of that. Time? And if you think that's the only quarter they're willing to skim on, you're fucking wrong. In a few situations, I've noticed that the show doesn't actually move objects on screen by animating at all, but instead uses JPEGs with tweening to make it look animated, leading to funny scenes like this wagon's wheels not moving while it goes down a path. Doesn't help that 
but most of the series has little to no shading, making everything look even more awkward somehow. The animation quality can't solely be placed on the South Korean studios that were commissioned to animate it though. In fact, I'd say it's way more the fault of the storyboarders, who obviously either didn't have much experience with a show of this nature, or simply didn't give a shit. In case anyone watching doesn't know about the process for creating an animated piece of media, usually you start with a script, then it has to go through rewrites, that kind of thing, the voice actors record, and afterwards the team creates a storyboard, which is basically a moving line of stills and images to give animators at a commission studio blueprints for how they should lay out and animate a scene. When it comes to big studios like Nick or Disney, they can be a bit more lenient with these boards, since they have more money they can use to help the production look better regardless. But for most other series and anime productions, storyboards are really important. Even if a series does have a good amount of money, bad storyboarding can make it look like an absolute disaster. Insert Steven Universe reference here. And the flip side is true for good animations. Ever wonder why Rise of the TMNT, Lego Monkey King, or One Punch Man look so good despite seemingly having industry standard budgets? It's all in the storyboarders, who on those series happen to be some of the best in the business that can create impressive stuff thanks to their work ethic and skill. Just look at some of this shit, they basically animated the scenes by their lonesome. What I'm saying with all this is that the main people to blame for how the series looks are its staff, not the studios who animated it, which for this show includes one that did work for Avatar The Last Airbender that I know had great storyboarding, and I can prove this incompetence by pointing out some easy to notice shit. For one, the trailer shows off one of the shots for a storyboard and Yikes, that's bad. I'm not exactly a great artist myself, but I say with no exaggeration that I could do much better than that. Seriously though, the character designs and lighting choices are really inconsistent. On many occasions, the characters just won't look as they usually do, or appear off in an uncanny way. And that idea seems to be best shown in the end credits, which has radically different still images of the main characters doing things, showing that the coordination for style among artists wasn't all that present. On about as many occasions, you can also see characters go from being in shadow, to out of shadow, to back in shadow in a matter of seconds. For any storyboarders that know how to properly light a scene and angle shadow, that shouldn't happen. Artists who do storyboards most likely also know that it's better to practice before taking on more ambitious shots you're not used to. Since like anything, if you jump headfirst into a new skill without any knowledge, you're pretty likely to fall on your face faster than get it right. Unfortunately for them, and humorously for me however, the High Guardian crew doesn't seem to know the meaning of common sense, so they try to pull off something as complex as aerial flying scenes multiple times, and I swear, every time they do it, it somehow looks worse. You really get the feeling that the artist watched a scene from Little Witch Academia or Tanya the Evil and thought, yeah, I can do that, and tried to do their best recreation after watching the scenes once. There's just nothing fluid at all about any of the aerial scenes. They're all either boring, awkward, or downright laughable. The show just can't pull off finer details or even basic storyboarding in a competent way whatsoever. Like, look at this dream sequence from the first episode. So the mom throws her sword at Rose before being swallowed by vines or whatever, nice. Then after the vines go away, only her sword is left. But wait, she just threw the sword at Rose before she got swallowed. Why is the sword the only thing left? This is something you would learn to iron out after the most simple revision. How did it get through to production? In most scenes, none of the background characters move, meaning the storyboarders weren't capable of keeping track of that detail and most likely had them added later on without thinking how weird it would look for them to be stuck in one position the whole time. Or how about the fact the show uses actual, like not subtly traced over or already drawn actual images of bread, the bottom of a lamppost, and other kinds of objects if you look hard enough to find them. There's no way that through instruction you could get an animation studio to pull off such a weird error, at least for a professional production. So I'm gonna go ahead and assume it was added in post-production for some reason that will forever elude me. Not enough errors? Multiple times characters walk on top of the background. Outstanding. There's really just nothing more I can say about it. Okay, that's a lie, but I want to be able to get this video done in a reasonable time frame, so that's gonna have to be all for now. If you told me at the start of this year that by the end of it I was going to make an overly analytical, long tirade about High Guardian Spice, a show that for the longest time people thought wouldn't come out, I probably would have believed you because this shit happens to me so often I've pretty much gotten under the pain. But if you told me to what extent I would loathe it, then I might question you. This show was simply doomed from the start to be hated by the virtue of the platform it was streaming on, Crunchyroll, who has a reputation for saying they directly support the anime industry with their funds and originals, and this clearly has nothing to do with anime whatsoever. Would this show have gotten the same amount of attention or backlash if it was broadcast on Netflix or some other streaming service? Most likely not. 
though there would definitely still be videos like mine here, since, like I said, the show is terrible. But really, I do gotta wonder what CR were thinking. They just didn't have the right audience in mind for the show, plain and simple. And now that it's been in production hell for like three years and the end product is so bad that people won't even take the time to pirate it on Kiss Anime or anywhere else, a season two would be pretty shocking if not a completely insane decision. Hopefully, once the current anger surrounding the show has passed, people will only have room to laugh and make fun of the series like it rightfully deserves. But until then, I'm just stop, and I hope you enjoyed. My voice is completely destroyed after all this. Thanks for watching. See you all in the next one.